Hello and welcome back to the test screening. My name is Billy. And I'm Chloe and I have a microphone now. Yeah. You are sounding a lot crispier, a lot more pristine on the recording. What's happening today, Billy? Well, it's a very special episode today here on the test screening, the weekly home of all your current up-to-date film review and film discourse. We will be discussing the what in my opinion, are the best films of 2023. Ignore the Oscars. Ignore the Golden Globes. Ignore <laughs> the BAFTAs. Yes. This is the only the award ceremony you need to be concerned about. This is about. the only opinion. Only list. This is the only opinion this is that the matters. Only... This is... If you disagree, you're wrong. Yeah, exactly. This is the gospel. This is what this you is... should be taking. There's... Exactly, exactly. So, we're going to start off with some honourable mentions. These are some films that didn't quite make it onto Billy's list, but they were very close to getting on there. One of them was kicked off just yesterday evening. That's how recent Indeed. this <laughs> list is. <laughs> it's, so, it's very hot off the press. It's very fresh. A few of, a few didn't make the list. Fresh. A few were in the list and were kicked off by other films later. So, um, I'll be taking you through that as I list them off just now. Brilliant. Right. Let's get to it. Go for it, Billy. So first we have American Symphony, an American documentary uh, featured on Netflix, centering around the American musician John Batiste as he um, is commissioned to compose a piece recounting um, black history with the American Symphonic Orchestra, all whilst dealing with the um, t- tremendous health battle his wife underwent throughout the um, at the time he was composing and rehearsing for the symphony. Um, a testament to just the incredible artistry of John Batiste and how thoughtful and passionately he composes and thinks about and perceives music, but also a really heart, heart-wrenching and moving tribute to the dedication and bond and support that him and his wife have for each other during these very stressful and emotional times and just despite you know being a netflix documentary that can sometimes look a little bit overly polished this just felt from a visual perspective very tactile and incredibly cinematic well worth checking out then we have one of my favorite comedies of the year a welcome and wildly entertaining revitalization of the mockumentary genre which i felt was sorely in need of another classic theater camp feels simultaneously hugely irreverent in its deconstruction of the drama school archetypes and loving in its tribute to their dedication of wringing the most explosive results out of theatre. The fictional crew's mockery of the characters can be felt in the direction and the edit which I loved, adding to the comedy, and for me it's the closest thing we have to a modern Christopher Guest, a classic in the vein of something like this is Spinal Tap. Yes, I know we were both very fond of it personally and everyone who I've recommended it to has found it uh, tremendously humorous and enjoyable as well we then have the big cultural billion dollar grossing juggernaut that was oppenheimer and whilst i didn't feel that this was quite the masterpiece that some critics made it out to be christopher nolan should absolutely be commended for making an engrossing character focused historical drama that juggles chronology in its timeline to this degree and feels so epic in scope yet is so deeply and intimately entrenched in one carries subjectivity um, while still remaining compelling for three hours. That's a really terrific, terrific achievement in of itself. Then there is Anatomy of a Fall, a Palme d'Or winning uh, French picture, featuring one of the strongest leading actress performances of the year, Sandra Hula, playing an author who is charged with the death of her, the murder of her husband, who dies under mysterious circumstances. She brings gravitas and weight, but also at times crippling sadness and introspection to this role. It's immensely layered her performance. It's um, in one sense a courtroom drama, but it has an incredibly dense screenplay, like kind of venturing beyond the standard, the standard legal drama fair and posing fascinating questions about how we judge and speculate upon people, given our own pre-existing baggage and viewpoints. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. was a really wonderful new addition to the uh, coming of age genre, which I know you and I hold very dear, based off an American novel from the 1970s. And it's proof that you can present sympathy and tenderness without sacrificing frankness in detailing the trials and tribulations of growing up. As we see this young girl move out of New York City to New Jersey and start in an entirely new neighborhood and school, it has a smoothness and visual presentation 
but it's not sanitized or saccharine. It's very authentic in the way it unpacks the shifting dynamics in burgeoning adolescent friendships and you know between young girls in um, and changing environments too. Uh, Blackberry featured an amazingly ruthless dramatic turn from Glenn Howerton who plays Dennis in It's Always Sung in Philadelphia. The drama itself is addictive and compulsively entertaining in its account of the rise and fall of the Blackberry phone company. The caustic and aggressive dialogue, the engaged the engaging succession style docudrama look and the push pull dynamic of the central trio, it's razor sharp in its examination of the pitfalls and of how business ambition can bump and bump against technical care for a product. Yeah. This Blackberry film feature that little game where you've got the little platform and you have to bounce the ball. <laughs> because that's the I thing think that it I remember does. the most about I th- Blackberry. I think <laughs> <laughs> I love that that was your takeaway from that phone, not the data, not the texting. Not, no, not the, like, it was the technical that. Data. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ab- abs- absolutely. I mean, it's probably what I would have taken from it as well. Um, I think it does feature at one point, you'll be pleased to hear. So that's definitely of note. Um, dream scenario, maybe the most perfect casting of Nicolas Cage ever. And he delivers, for me, one of his absolute best performances. They manage to extract his zaniness and his absurd theatricality and a really convincing everyman, everyday quality that he, that I haven't seen from him before. It was really pleasantly surprising. It's then applied to a fantastical scenario that brilliantly facilitates some hilariously relevant commentary about the hypocritical and cruel nature of cancel culture with pathos and comedy uh, in equal measure. Uh, Earth Mama was a realistic and at times bleak but empathetic and hopeful drama with flights of poetic uh, surrealism in its dream sequences, even-handed and absorbing in how it portrays the central mother's kind of terse attitude and unruly personality and her vices, but also the great capacity for warmth and support she has for her children. We need more films like this examining the nuances and challenges of motherhood inside flawed legal systems. 20 Days in Morapol is the rawest, by far, war documentary I've ever watched, shot by journalists and war correspondents on the front lines of the city of Morapol during the start of the Russians' invasion of Ukraine. At no detail of the human suffering and destruction of the city is spared at all. It's incredibly harrowing, incredibly intense, but it's a vital account of how rapidly city and lives can be destroyed. You know, if a power as vast as Russia is allowed to just spiral out of control and do what they want. It's a brutal but necessary piece of work. Um, then How to Blow Up a Pipeline has complex moral issues and zeitgeisty subject matter around environmentalism combined with the white knuckle tension of an 80s style thriller with its or, or a Hollywood heist film with its throbbing synth laden score and kind of driving steady cam focus direction. It also has a really cohesive structure that brings together a lot of the backstories of the characters and you know, unpacks these urgent environmental issues. Really tense, but really. We also reviewed this well. one. We reviewed yes, this we did. one we'll on, re- the, on the show, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Was a big fan of that at the time, and uh, it certainly lingered long, long in the mind, both its issues and its style since then. And my final honourable mention is a documentary called The Mission, which focuses on American missionary John Chow, who sadly uh, died trying to reconnect and conduct missionary work with an indigenous tribe off the coast of India. And the documentary is equally respectful and reverential of his dedication to Christianity, John Chow's dedication, and how steadfast he was in his faith, whilst it still incorporates, you know, expert opinions and family member opinions and historian opinions on the various, you know, very complex ethical dilemmas that surround missionary work. And it was a very interesting, but also very moving piece of work. And that's it for our honourable mentions. So now, drumroll please. In, in, I'll insert drum roll here. Uh, <laughs> we will go on to the main event, and I'm excited because again, this is a very fresh list. This was updated literally last night. Um, <laughs> I have seen some of these. I've not seen all of them. Um, you've got to bear in mind that we are in the UK, so some things haven't been released. Yet. So I think. Um, maybe later on in the next couple of weeks when we get back to our reviews this list may be updated but this is how it is and now looking back on 2023 the best Mm -hmm. films that Billy has seen and is now recommending to you and after each film 
Billy, if you can say what rating you gave it, um, and if you were wondering what that little blank box is in the corner, that's so that I can put the grade. Um, it's not a glitch. I, you know, there's method to my madness. So, very, very intentional. Further ado, very intentional, super intentional. Without any further ado, let's get into it, Billy. This is uh, number ten. Absolutely. So number ten is Alexander Payne's The Holdovers, his latest offbeat comedy drama, centering around an obstinate and kind of single-minded uh, history teacher who's forced to remain at his 70s Boston boarding school over the Christmas holidays to supervise an intelligent but kind of wayward and disobedient student because he is unable to go home for the Christmas holidays due to unexpected and unforeseen family circumstances. This is probably one of the easiest picks and least challenging picks in the top 10 for me to recommend to you guys because it begins in a place of kind of screwball contemptuous comedy and a battle of wits between the two pair one of them is played by the always reliable reliably excellent paul giamatti you wish it won a golden globe very well deserved here so it begins in that place but it really like gorgeously evolves into probably the best film about family and friendship that i've seen all year it really embraces the kind of the steady and gentle cadence of many old-fashioned two-handed character dramas from the 1940s through to the 70s. Um, reminded me a lot of the 50s film Marty. Interestingly, if that had been kind of a two-hander. And it makes such solid use of its fairly lengthy two-hour-plus runtime to examine these characters' kind of hostile standoff, insecurities, and eventual exception and growth with each other. And it's done with the most beautiful pacing and the just the right injection of offbeat quirk that you kind of expect from an Alexander Payne film. His previous works include The Descendants and Sideways, of which I'm a big fan. The growth the pair undergo is some of the most organic character development I've seen in recent years. It feels completely natural, totally believable. You invest in it t- completely. And you feel as though you know these characters so thoroughly by the end that you could spend another hour with them. I certainly could have. I almost didn't want the experience to end. It's so satisfying to watch a comedy drama that treats its characters with such warmth and compassion, yet it doesn't feel sugary and or cloying or saccharine in tone. It doesn't resort to cheap sentimentality to elicit the emotional responses. Even if there's like the lightest dusting of sugar at you know, towards the back end and towards the final developments. You know, even if there is a little bit of that, it feels completely earned by everything you've seen up until that point. And I just left it wanting to be a better person. So that was really excellent. And that's a very solid A grade for me. Boom. A has been awarded. Right, next one. So in number nine, nine, this is, um, oh, instantly I should say, the holdovers is I watched it on streaming early, but it is out in UK cinemas next Friday, really. So January the nineteenth, and then at number nine we have a Sky original. This has already been out in cinemas kind of late last year, but you can now stream it on Sky on Sky Demand on Sky Cinema. This is Todd Haynes's May December, a very blackly satirical expose on the creative process and destructive nature of the tabloids in American culture which is another real home run for Todd Haynes, in my opinion. He's a personal favourite director of mine, and he's really, you know, at the top of his game here. We kind of witness this actress slowly insert herself into the lives of this kind of kind of all-American, very bright, white picket fence family of the, one of the southern states because she's researching a role, um, a biopic that's being made about the mother because she is a uh, feigned a child predator who abused and then married one of her students who is the husband that we see in the film it's actually based off a real life american case and as we watch these pair kind of at first appear these trio really first appear amicable but then you know the the dynamics slowly grow more toxic and poisonous as the film progresses you know our sympathies and notions of ethical practice in developing artwork are quietly yet yeah, like expertly put through the ring you know i i love films like this where seemingly not a ton is happening on the surface but there is so much just subtext and psychological warfare going on underneath like every line of dialogue it's got a deliciously twisted and subversive screenplay i've seen it three times now and each time i watch it i pick up on a new piece of symbolism or a new sort of pivot in the character motivations or 
a differing perspective but the you know the every scene is drenched in subject subtext but it's not too overt or heavy handed in its symbolism, even if it's even in its most sort of pointed and precise moments, you know, the subtext so unnaturally so naturally, sorry, unspools from the drama. And it's got grippingly nuanced performances by Natalie Portman, Julianne Moore and Charles Melton. Um, a couple of whom may be in for Oscar nominations soon. The warfare between them is kind of so dexterous and complex, it's it's tough to know who's holding the power in any given scenario and Todd Haynes is a director he walks this tightrope thin balancing act between a deeply uncomfortable like grounded look at how debilitating and lifelong um, the effects of abuse can be and a deadpan fascinating indictment of how Hollywood arguably has perversive has perversely commodified stories like this for its own gain and at times it, the tone of the story kind of borders on camp, which is almost like it's mocking that side of the industry and these people. It's kind of gloriously entertaining, but incredibly dark and uncomfortable in other scenes. And you know, there's a there's just days worth of questions to ponder in this really deeply unsettling, but really like intricately insightful work. Love this one. That's this is another ray. Hey, hey, and on to. One of my personal favourites of the year. I know you are very, very. I, mean, you, I remember ages ago you saying to me, "You have to go see this. You will love this." <laughs> and I it um, just when I saw that you'd put it in your top ten, I smiled so wide. I think people thought there was something <laughs> wrong. I was just like staring at my phone, like <laughs> grinning, just being like, "Um, I was happy that this has yeah, made your top ten. <laughs> it's great to see. Because normally I tend to, you know, um, venture more towards, gravitate towards more heavy, you know, heavy emotional dramas. But, you know, I just, I do have a soft spot for a good coming of age film or a really good comedy. And this didn't necessarily surprise me because I thought I would enjoy this going in. But damn, if it didn't exceed my expectations. And that's Bottoms at number eight. Perhaps the most surprising entry in my, into my top. 10 this year not necessarily surprising when i watched it in terms of its quality but i i wasn't did i did i anticipate it going above anatomy of a fall theater camp oppenheimer no not at the time but it was it's, it's i i i wish comedies today were as committed to riotous rambunctious raunchy chaotic energy and tore up the american high school comedy rule book like this does it's bold. It's a wildly fun, refreshingly new, I think, take on the genre while still kind of tributing the archetypes as well. It's got far and away the best log line of the year. Two lesbians set up a high school fight club so that they can sleep with popular cheerleaders. I was just like, yeah, I'm sold. Get me in the cinema yeah. now. Um, and it yes. it borrowed the kind of sharp and punchly and punchy intellectually pop culture centric dialogue of the recent book smart, which is also a big favorite of ours, but it considerably dials up the raunch factor and cranks the chaotic screwball energy like into the stratosphere. It was like a, it was a breath of fresh air to see a comedy that, that also just sets its rules clearly in a heightened world that isn't strictly adhering to realism and kind of just, you know, it goes, you know, we're going a bit crazy. This isn't supposed to be taken seriously. This is going to go wildly unrealistic and kind of almost like fan fantastical you know, towards the end, but we're just doing this completely in service of our message and of entertaining you guys and making some, you know, very sort of valid points in the process. And it totally nails that. It, I, it drove so hard into hysterically anarchic action near the end. And it doesn't, it just doesn't, it doesn't care and isn't concerned with how many people will follow it into that territory because it knows the people that will, will just be totally 100% on board with it. And I was, you know, underneath the bedlam of it all, Bottoms manages to be, you know, string through this genuinely smart commentary on women's uh, right to defend themselves and fight back against aggressive predatory male behaviour and empower each other by doing so and learning fighting techniques. And this is then reinforced by the director's really great eye for crunchy, fierce, slapstick fight sequences. But I do tend to vary my grades a bit more. Obviously, <laughs> this is another A. Obviously, because it's the top 10 list, it's going to be lots of A's and A pluses. Um, I had a blast with this one. This is just so much fun. And also just, again, 
when you dig under the surface surprisingly deep i agree and i absolutely love this film and i am here for like all the lesbian coming of age films that we've been getting because yes get more of them i have them before and i just i love the fact that they're messy you know they're not like there's some coming of age films that are about like women that just don't quite get it <laughs> and i feel like even though this is a a totally you know out there crazy you know slapstick kind of horror show in some ways i still felt more seen by this than i have from a lot of other stuff so yeah i was well on board with this film i absolutely yeah. adored it nah. it really gets on board with like the character specifics and the, the quality of the performances i think really sells that for it and relationships are messy and it gets that and the next one is a complete 180 <laughs> oh, it really is so this is i kind of initially thought this would end up a little bit higher on the list um it went in at number five and was subsequently kind of pushed down by a couple of films but it's it's still a really tremendous tremendous feat of filmmaking by one of the titans of american cinema um both crime cinema and just cinema in general um, and a late career highlight for one of the great masters martin scorsese this is killers of the flower moon you know i love that so deep into his filmography, he's still delivering challenging and expertly crafted work that, you know, simultaneously feels indebted to his classic works like, you know, Goodfellas and Casino and those movies. But it, he still feels like he's breaking new ground for himself and getting even more introspective and kind of inward looking as he progresses through his career. And I think that's really wonderful to see for someone who could so easily just stick to their stick to their guns and stick to their sort of established tropes and rule book and just probably still fun in solid work but he's you know still pushing boundaries even an elderly age and so deep into his career it's a frightening and immensely detailed account of the osage tribal murders that occurred in you know the osage osage county in oklahoma from the 1910s through to 1930s perpetrated by Amer evil american businessmen who were looking to steal land and financial gain from the osage community by kind of marry marrying into the families and then murdering um, men, women, and children, so they could inherit um, the goods and the lands with oil. Um, Scorsese lends this story that epic and vast scope we come to expect from his decade-spanning dramas. But this one is also one of his most intimate and human films, too. There's a lot of time spent just sitting with Leonardo DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone and Robert De Niro, just kind of unpacking how these men were able to you know, worm their way into these communities and just, you know, show them, you know, sort of very superficial um, uh, care and sympathy when, you know, actually the, mo the motives were altogether more sinister and ulterior. You know, so much of the dialogue is so subdued and mellow in how plainly it states these early intentions of these characters to destroy and manipulate the Osage people. There's a, re there's a really early conversation between Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro, where you go, are they really like talking about this so plainly this early on in the film? It's kind of it's surprising how quickly it sort of incites and gets the ball rolling on these issues. But I think it just speaks to how um, starkly and powerfully it presents the insidious and banal nature of evil. It, you know, and it begins so ordinarily in people's conversations. And how it then moves on to perniciously destroying and poisoning an entire community of people. That's the real triumph of this for me. Um, and of course, it's a revisionist take on the Western, and it powerfully kind of recontextualizes that genre to um, relay a period of American history that I don't think enough people know about, and more people should know about. That's a re So it's really wonderful that the film exists for that reason. And also, it's, it's generosity and respect towards the Osage um, community's perspective. And the three leads also delivering, you know, dark and anguished performances. You know, there's a lot of things that make this a clear 2023 highlight. Not quite an A plus for me on this one, but very, very solid A. Solid A, kind of creeping into A plus territory. Is the next one A plus? Are the, we getting the there next now? one? Is is the first of our six A pluses the real top okay. two? Okay. Okay. So let's. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> you are happy about this one I know you are uh, yes I mean listen I, I do feel like I need to clarify that I am not the girliest girl girl on the planet 
But the films that I have enjoyed the most this year have been like the campy, feminine, like, <laughs> I've just, you know, just done it for me this year. It's just been, it's yeah. been the year of pink, of like aggressive pink. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, we had a shortage of pink paint because of the one particular film's production design. <laughs> but, um, and I think that's one of the reasons this year has been such an exciting year for cinema. You know, it's just, we've got real, you know, female empowerment has really come to the forefront of a lot of big and very impactful and widespread features. And also just continue, and the independent works that have been doing that too have come to more notoriety as well. So heading in the right direction on that stuff, let's keep it going. At number six, we have such a simple story and yet so profoundly moving in past lives. So oh, Ling she, Siong, I've got I've got Barbie as the next one. <laughs> oh, maybe oh, no. it's like switch up there. So going on from Killers of the Flower Moon, what's next? So at number six, we have Celine Siong's beautiful, exquisite, elegiac drama, Past Lives. Such a simple story and yet so profoundly moving. Two childhood sweethearts reconnecting as friends two decades later. It does such an amazing job of tackling really far-reaching, all-encompassing, universal themes, you know, the idea of soulmates, reconnecting with your younger self and earlier life, the decisions we make and how we perceive those and the impacts of those as we age, yet renders them with such precision in the main character's central dynamic and relationship that, you know, it's that wonderful um, combination of the the central pairing feeling so intimate and yet you can still just t outside your experience but you can still totally find a way into it emotionally and identify with it on your own level it's so wonderful to see a director turn a lens on such large questions but have the confidence in both the material her actors and the audience to just let scenes breathe the dialogue it so evocatively exhibits the character's emotions and you know, with very coherent and simple wording in the screenplay and the dialogue but the pacing between you know the actors exchanges um and also the the kind of very spacious and kind of pulled back approach to shot composition it makes these acts it means these interactions at sometimes you know achingly beautiful there's a really unique score with more traditional classical piano along with these ambient tinged reverbed chiming percussion some of the most unique scoring i've heard in uh, i've heard in a while and it really helps to delicately externalise those very internal emotional journeys that these characters are going on. And perhaps my favourite thing about past lives, though, is the mature and sophisticated outlook on our lives, decisions it takes, and how the interaction between the pair seems to almost mirror, a, you know, an, an internal kind of figurative dialogue between that we may have with our past selves and the places that we come from, you know, geographically and sort of mentally as well. It's such a deep and layered story and yet it's so just sort of effortless and easy to get into on the surface it's just it's a wonderful wonderful film who directs that again celine's song debut feature crazy i i thought i was going crazy at the beginning i i could have swore you said celine dion <laughs> it's like there might have been a, there might have been a swipe <laughs> God, if only past lives was half as melodramatic. <laughs> and that is the first of our A pluses, isn't it? Indeed. Everything from out here on out is an A plus. Ooh. A plus. Okay. okay, so going past lives into... At number five, the, the one everyone's been waiting for, Cultural Juggernaut, the cinematic bombshell, the 1.3 billion box office grossing Titanic. Um, release that was Greta Gerwig's Barbie. Now, well, yeah. this had the mammoth task of wearing, you know, of wearing so many different cinematic hats this year and being such like a cultural movement. It's like, you know, is it actually going to succeed and be a coherent, you know, um, dis you know, distillable, easily digestible story in the end? Because you know, it's trying to be an absurdist, fantastical, and cine literate Hollywood comedy with the most colourful pink sets on, you know, probably in cinematic history, you know, literally causing an international shortage of pink paint. It's 
trying to be a surprisingly deep and philosophical take on the challenges of existing as a woman in today's patriarchal and, and aesthetic look obsessed society also a reverential and yet reflective take on how the barbie toy brand impacted stereotypes and perspectives on gender roles for better and for worse and the fact that it managed to balance all of this and be genuinely insightful and emotionally engaging i cried twice i did not expect <laughs> that from a barbie film my god but none it of just, us it saw that coming none of us it saw got it the tear that's going man that billy eilish song for oh. just so beautifully Good. incorporated as well. A great song on its own, but the way it's worked into the film, <laughs> just just seamless and totally befitting. The fact that it balanced all of this different stuff and was still like euphorically entertaining and, and really, really meaningful thematically is a minor miracle as far as I'm concerned. You know, how flamboyant the humour is, it elevates how pristine the emotional climaxes are. It's really got, you know, emotional peaks and valleys in it, which is wonderful to see. It's not just sitting at the one sort of tonal level the whole way through. You know, it's got help, like I said, from that exquisite theme song from Billie Eilish. Pivots in and out of the emotions seamlessly. Ryan Gosling. Icon Ryan Gosling. delivered. We don't, do we need just to Ryan say Gosling more just, than just Ryan Gosling? I don't Gosling. think we need to. Just Ryan Gosling. <laughs> he is he is Kenuff. He delivered one of the most committed, is- extravagant outrageously extravagant yeah, entertaining supporting performances in many years more large budget Hollywood features should be striving to be this sem- thematically substantive without sacrificing um, big budget spectacle ex- and exuberance in visual design and humour fantastic stuff here and the clear winner of Barbenheimer no questions asked <laughs> a victor has been named and it is Barbie oh, it has. that is it that's the end fight is over Billy has spoken and it's Barbie. Happy days. That is an A plus. Okay, now we're getting we're getting juicy. Now we're getting into the juicy stuff. Slightly yeah, controversial really. pick of this next one. I yes, feel. it's not it's not quite gelled with everyone, and I can see why. But personally, I very much vibed with it, and really, really saw at, le- at least what I think Bradley Cooper was going for with his biopic of Leonard Bernstein, um, famed American composer of musicals such as West Side Story, Maestro. Available on Netflix now if anyone wants to seek it out. And I think of all the major award contenders this year, it's perhaps the one that would be easiest to label as cheap Oscar bait. And I know some people think the first half is not particularly substantive, but I personally have to disagree. I love the stylistic balance that Bradley Cooper was able to bring to the story from like a directorial perspective and what that first half meant for that. It's the first half flights of fantasy and kind of blurring between the more realistic meetings between the central romantic duo Bradley Cooper and Carey Mulligan and how they kind of immaculately and seamlessly burst into these and participate in these musical number rehearsals from Leonard Bernstein's most famous musicals as he's preparing those performances. For me, this fo- this section focused less on specific character detail for me and more on a really enveloping visual distillation of how an artist's work can kind of act as an extension of their emotional expression in a relationship and how those things can kind of become intertwined and how that may bring people to close together and kind of aided by this exquisitely like smoky noir kiss cinematography just beautiful and then the more performance driven kind of more tempered in terms of um the more sort of theatrical stuff, um, but still, you know, gorgeous and more visually restrained second half. Um, it exemplified the tense and kind of deeply felt push-pull dynamic that was so well performed by Kerry Mulligan and Bradley Cooper. Obviously, because it's a it's a much bigger, it's a much showy performance, there's a lot of makeup, it's, and it's based off the more famous person of the, of the two. Um, Bradley Cooper is obviously like getting a lot of praise and attention and discussion lumped up on him, but I, I don't think people should, you know, to brush Carrie Mulligan aside here. I don't think she's always been. I've always seen her as the most expressive of actresses, but here she's really pulled out all the stops and she's delivering um, the most range I think I've ever seen from her. And I loved how generous with screen time and with the perspective. Um, the film was with her and the screenplay was with her she is a really really significant part of this story and the sacrifices that she had to make for Lena Bernstein's career are not glossed over 
And whilst you know his genius and talent is still very, and his struggle is a is a very famous uh, gay creative man, was is not is also not sidestepped either. It's I thought it was very well balanced between the two of them. And for me, it's the best work of her career. And until last night, it was my favourite leading actress performance of the sort of major major awards contenders. And Bradley Hooper does a stand-up job, an excellent job of ensuing the hefty makeup is not a distraction or a substitute for a lived-in characterization of Bernstein. It's like fully integrated and he's throwing himself into these gigantic physical gestures in these scenes of famous conducting performances with really exhilarating results. I loved it. It might not necessarily be for everyone, but I would urge everyone to check it out just to see what they think. This is at number four, another right plus Maestro. It's on Netflix. Check it out. And also, I think Carrie Mulligan's like having a moment at the moment. I think um, she was great in Saltburn as well. I know she only had a small part, but I loved her. <laughs> that mm. she was she was a standout I, I in that watch, for me. I could watch her and Rosamund Pike all day. I think they should have yeah, a spin off. I <laughs> yeah, I do. Sort of the the more chaotic, seedy energy of Carrie Mulligan's character, and the more kind of upstanding, peppy, upper class energy of um, Rosamund Pike. That they would go somewhere. Together. Yeah, it's There's manifesting an excellent podcast assault, in assault there that, Oh, there really yeah. is. It really is. Get okay, the, get a microphone um, in front of those two. Moving on to this is one of my favourites of the year. I actually think that because there are some that I haven't seen, this would be my number one. If this was Ooh. my list, and it was my number one for a while, it was about halfway through the year. This was my number one, and until until I rewatched number two over Christmas, and whether you, you well, no, it's number two. Until I rewatched number two over Christmas, and also saw last night's film, this was number one. But the fact that it's still at three, you know, it just doesn't do it any disservice. It's still fantastic, and I think. Probably the be- easily the best independent film of the year, no doubt. Um, Rye Lane, a British, uh, a British vibrant, um, gloriously euphoric romantic comedy with two really strong black leads that just set me out of the cinema, skipping with a spring in my step. Now, it's just, it's the cinematic equivalent of a ray of sunshine. It's, whilst the story of two mid-twenties Londoners recently out of relationships and in stagnant careers, kind of meeting by chance and striking up a connection over the course of a 24-hour period, you know, it's it's not as historically significant as Killers of the Flower Moon's story. It's not as rich in subtextual detail as May, December, and it's not as emotionally sincere as past lives or as like theatrical and stylistically polished as Maestro. But sometimes you just get a film, usually an independent one, funnily enough, um, that just isn't, you know, un- is unencumbered by the big Hollywood studio machine. You get a film that takes a relatively simple premise and bolsters it with such great technical writing and performance prowess that it's basically executed to perfection. And that's exactly what Ryland does. The dialogue is packed with these electric one-liners that I'm still appreciating, you know, three viewings in and picking up on, you know, after the first time having seen it. The chemistry between the two leans is effortless and just dynamite. They're so smooth and warm and happy and, and comfortable in each other's presence. But, you know, they can deliver a, a zinging joke or one-liner with great efficiency and just excellent comedic timing. There's a line that just in the the pub scene with the two couples that had this the cinema i saw this in in absolute stitches so well timed and the pacing is is watertight i mean this is the tightest the tightest most tight, tightly paced film i've seen in a in a long time and you know the ca- the causal chain is so strong in the screenplay that every plot development makes perfect sense and the 75 minute runtime it barrels through it absolutely blows by but also just doesn't feel or become exhausting it's like it's just measured enough that we feel as though we've gotten the perfect amount of time with these characters but it's still you know just breezes by and is just just total thrill rides from start to finish i think the positive even though it's not a particularly complex story emotionally i think the positivity around its themes of 
young people letting go of toxicity, not letting people talk down to them, learning to appreciate themselves and having the confidence to take personal and professional risks is really uplifting and I think I think very important for the moment we're kind of in right now for this generation and talking about mental health and things like that. I thought it was those themes are really well executed. I would sooner a film take simple themes and execute them well than take more more nuanced ones and not unpack them well enough. And Ryan Lane is on the right side of that line. It's got for me that for me the most refreshing thing about it though is is its look. It's the most compelling recent testament to me that comedies should not they don't need to skimp on visual inventiveness and just rely on the dialogue the use of wide lenses here the elements of surrealism kind of with the characters sort of going into the stories they are telling and sort of narrating them as they're happening on screen the kinetic camera moves the vibrant locations that give the film a personality all its own the unconventional shot choices and camera placement elevates so many sequences in right line and all of this results and synergizes perfectly and just results in it being pure cinematic bliss. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's probably the most fun you'll have with a film this year. I couldn't agree more. I love the way that this film looks. I love the acting. I love the performances. Yeah, it just it just hit well. It hit well for me. Okay, and yeah. now we are on to, I believe, number two. We are number two. So, yeah. Rye Lane was at one, two swapped this out, and then two was bumped out. But this, again, on paper, doesn't sound like like a. If you're being judgmental or being closed minded, it doesn't sound like you know a really significant piece of filmmaking. But it absolutely one hundred percent is, and for me, is just pushing the boundaries of what an animated film could sh- could and should be capable of, just into into the stratosphere is into just new undiscovered territory just new into the spider-verse even oh it yes in into the (laughs) spider-verse flawless transition thank you although although this isn't um this isn't into the spider-verse the first entry in the series this is actually across the spider-verse the sequel to the oscar-winning cel-shaded animated reboot of the spider-man or reimagining of the spider-man universe that came out back in 2018 and everyone was incredibly hyped for the sequel it got the highest of praise from critics and fans and i went in and was absolutely blown away it's probably without hyperbole the best looking animated film i've ever watched the way it combines so it's zipping between different animation styles in a single scene in between shots even the cell shaded, the stop motion Lego animation, even in that one brief scene, the computer generated stuff, the kind of the element of rotoscoping in one bit. It's just, just on a technical level, it's a complete and utter marvel. How I mean, I there has been stories about how the crew was put under kind of undue pressure and not particularly suitable working conditions, but you know we do have to, and that is not okay. But they should absolutely be credited, and you know their their amazing work that they've done here. It's just it boggles my mind, even you know multiple viewings later, just how much detail, just even in single shots, there are in Across the Spider Verse. But the film is not just all looks. I think it the the cinematic market recently has become kind of saturated with multiverse stories, and I think. Obviously, we have real success with it, like Everything Everywhere All at Once. And I think this is up there with Everything Everywhere All at Once in terms of how well it's utilizing the sort of the makeup of multi- this idea of multiple universes to make up a story that is, from a screenplay perspective, incredibly kind of intricate in how it's darting between many different universes and plot lines. But it's keeping things coherent, it's keeping things um, followable and digestible and sort of and tangible as well it's like even though it's the animation is incredibly sort of vibrant and um blistering it's that you, you still feel like you've got a handle on it it's you it still feels tactile you can really like um feel the energy that was um and the fun that i think a lot of people were having making this film and it uses the sort of the 
the makeup of the multiverse to create some really interesting geography in terms of fight sequences and you know, you know, zipping in and out of different universes that I hadn't hadn't really even seen before. So that so it felt very innovative in an action sense and also again like everything ever all at once it's using the this sort of idea of the multiverse and sort of lives being lived simultaneously in converging timelines and some very well built out lore in the case of the Spider Verse to talk about some really interesting themes of can we seize our own destiny can we you know do we need to follow the path we are given to what extent should we stray from that and can we be our own person and that gave it like an, an extra emotional depth that i don't think any previous spider for spider-man films have had aside from the first spider-verse um entry in the trilogy and then it had, you know, the audacity to pull some blinding twist out of the bag at the very end, which does kind of mean that this film ends up being a part, kind of an Empire Strikes Back kind of part two of a, you know, the middle section of what's a, you know, a bigger three-part story. But it still has its own very coherent arc. And it feels like it is complete by the end, even though it still ends on a barnstorming cliffhanger that just gets me unbelievably hyped for the next entry beyond the spider first when that comes in the in the next few years um i think i i love not, this i really yeah. i really enjoyed it i must admit this is probably the only one that i kind of disagree with you on not because i don't think it's good i thought it was excellent but for me it was a little bit too busy there was a bit too much going on and i enjoyed the simplicity of the first film way more but that's just me and i appreciate i i you know i understand everything you're saying and i'm and i'm behind it for me it probably wouldn't be quite as high on the list but i did have a great time with it yeah i can totally see how this would be too much for some people and um how a lot of people would just find the the dexterity and sort of narrative and timeline jumping and just sort of the very sort of you know full on sonic and visual assault of it a bit much but um but just personally i i found it a very smooth and cohesive experience and um and i thought it was amazing okay so and now, obviously that's a plus and now eat breaths everybody the big moment the big moment and this is a surprise last minute entry to the list that has gone straight up to number one. I'm really curious to hear what you have to say about it, Billy. It is. <laughs> you were what cursing me for putting this in at the last minute. You were like, I have well, to redo I was like, I have to graphic. redo redo all my graphics again, and damn you. <laughs> I'm it's I'm fine. Sorry. I'm, it's I'm sorry, fine. but not sorry because it just it deserves it. It really does. You know, fresh off the press. A last minute spanner in the works, a close to the wire submission that I only saw last night, but as soon as it was finished, there was no doubt in my mind there wasn't even a contest as, as to this being number one. It just, there just wasn't. And for me, out of everything I've seen the past year, the best film of 2023 is Yorgos Lanthimos' Poor Things, starring Willem Dafoe, Emma Thompson, and Mark Ruffalo. Now, you mean Emma film... Stone? Emma Stone, sorry, my mad, my bad. <laughs> Emma Thompson. <laughs> oh, she would, she would be a very, very different vibe in this film. The yes, person Emma that Stone. This film needs is Nanny McPhee. Oh, it, <laughs> she needs to get in and get this thing under control. It is unruly as hell, but um, just totally, completely captivating as well. Um, I think in a film this bold and this insane kind of almost defies one of these abridged descriptions that I've been doing in this episode but so what I will focus on are the two main things that for me um, make it not just work but make it soar despite being so completely off the wall bizarre and that is the first is that despite being Despite all the extravagantly pompous and hilarious dialogue, the disturbing and provocative events of the story, the surreal and angular steampunk and charmingly artificial but breathtaking look of the production design, the messaging is so direct and empowering. I don't think I've ever seen a film that was this weird 
and <laughs> this sort of just strange in the performances and the visuals and everything but yet it was so the message and the th- main theme of it and the takeaway from it was so clearly distilled by the writer and the director and that is an amazing achievement and that's not to say that the messaging is beaten over the is beaten over your head or that it's super heavy handed but the um it's just the main character's progression is so well drawn and so clearly reinforced with out undue speechifying in the dialogue that you can really tangibly grasp the message of the film you know even at points where you go this is going in an interesting direction you'll get like an exchange that re- where you're kind of really sort of brought back to the key message of the piece and i just i love that about it it just shows that you know there is a place for atmospheric and experimental ambiguity but i just love the fact that this was so formally experimental and audacious and daring and yet was still so clear and focused from a theme and screenplay perspective and it it balances some tried and tested but well delivered points about the capacity for positivity and negativity in human beings it also serves as some really intuitively burningly empowering ideas about freedom in society sexual liberation and femininity that again going back to this idea that you were saying about how we were saying earlier about how this, that we felt there were so many um, great works empowering females both in the Hollywood and in independent sectors of the industry this year. Poor Things for me is absolutely like kind of along with Barbie kind of leading the charge in with that with the awards contenders this year. And then you have Emma Stone. Now I've ne- I've always liked Emma Stone thought she was good in La La Land if maybe not fully deserving of the Oscar compared to some of the other performances that year but I've, 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 I've never thought she was like an awards caliber actress to be honest I've always thought she was really good and reliable and solid well, actually she was really good in the favorite but she's kind of been on this steady kind of upcline in recent years and she delivers far and away best perf- acting performance of this year it's a role of such spectacularly unhinged physicality and linguistic acrobatics but she modulates and calms so seamlessly and emotively as the film progresses, as her character sort of, because um, her character starts at a very sort of undeveloped mental age, and then she kind of grows sort of less bombastic as the film grows up goes on. She does that so brilliantly as the film progresses that every pitch she delivers, every note she hits, from the most shrieking to the most steadfast and calm, is nothing. She is nothing less than it an extraordinary in this film and is never anything less than totally magnetic totally like all encompassing of your of your attention and there is so much more you can unpack theme visually set design wise in this film but that we wouldn't have time to go into here but for those key reasons plus the breathtaking production design the whacked out camera work that is really really taking some bold risks but totally pays off and totally fits the vibe of the performance and the set design for all those reasons there i i'm not sure i don't often i feel like the term masterpiece is overly in, is over way overly used but i'm kind of feeling like this may be this perhaps might be deserving of that moniker it's a really incredible film and Whilst there are, there are a couple awards contenders still left to see, like The Zone of Interest, like All of Us Strangers, like The Taste of Things, which are kind of more out towards the end of January, February time, this for me is the clear front runner for most of the major awards. If she doesn't take home Best Actress, it is an absolute crime. <laughs> Best film of 2023, Poor Things, by a mile. Wow. Well, let's have a look at the full list. Poor Things at the top. For 2023, and we're going to have to see how it does. We'll have to see if your um, predictions are correct, if if your views align with the rest of the world's Billy. Um, I am really excited, and we've got some amazing films that are already due for release in 2024. Um, some of which you just said that are, you know part of the 2023 you know awards like release schedule that just haven't quite landed in the UK yet. And also some really cool stuff coming up for the next year. I'm really excited and I'm excited to be talking about them all with you, Billy. 
I'm so excited too. We've uh, we've got the the Mean Girls musical reimagining coming up. Oh yeah, we've got uh, Dan Levy's new Netflix comedy drama Get Good Grief. We've mm-hmm. got um, a reimagining of the film Alive about the famed um, Alps plane crash um, on Netflix this time called Society of the Snow. So we've got some really interesting th- uh, work to talk about on incoming episodes. Do you agree with Billy? You need to let us know down in the comments. What was your list for the top 10 this year? Do some of them match up? Do you completely disagree? We want to know. We won't agree with you because you're wrong, but we still want to know. Because <laughs> I am always right. <laughs> you are always right. This has been established, Billy. <laughs> and with that, um, yeah, goodbye, everybody. And we will see you next time on the test screening. Please be sure to like, subscribe and follow us on all socials, streaming platforms and YouTube. Uh, Thank you very much for listening. Hope to see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.